someone might have a near-death experience, come back and regain consciousness and report to their family that's around them that they they met such and such a relative who was deceased. But as far as everybody there knows, that person is alive and well. Somebody just talked to them yesterday. And then a couple hours later, they get a phone call letting them know that this person had died suddenly of a heart attack uh, several hours before. So at the time of the near-death experience, that person really was dead. The near-death experiencer was the first to learn through their NDE. Welcome to What the Fuck Just Happened. I'm your host, Liz Enton. If you listen to the intro, you know my story. If not, here's a brief summary. I'm a science skeptic, and when my dad died, I took a shot in the dark and decided to investigate if there was any possible evidence of an afterlife. I assumed that was as realistic as Santa Claus, but I was desperate. However, I was so blown away by what I discovered that I wrote a book and launched this podcast. In this podcast, I will be talking to some fairly normal people about some really weird shit. I speak with everyone from psychic mediums and afterlife researchers to ordinary people who've had some inexplicable experiences. So come, listen, there's no need to draw any final conclusions. Keep an open mind and wonder, what the fuck just happened? Hi guys, I am back again with Darren McEnany doing an interview and talk with someone I'm so excited to have on. She made such a difference. She was very key in the early stage of my research and when I was just huddled up in bed in deep grief and desperate for hope that there was something more. This is Dr. Janice Holden and she is president of IANS, International Association for Near-Death Studies. She is also very logical, grounded, someone you can really trust her judgment. She is a professor of counseling at University of North Texas. She has a degree in psychology and used to teach psychology and as well had a private practice. And Dr. Holden, if there's anything I left out, you can pro introduce yourself better than I can. So also go ahead and give everyone an introduction. You did a great job, Liz. Actually, technically, my degree is in counselor education, and I was a counselor educator for 31 years at UNT, as you said, before I retired in 2019. So yeah, so now I'm a professor emerita. Well, thanks for coming on. So I think we should start by explaining what exactly is a near-death experience, also called an NDE. Mm -hmm. Well, my definition, and, and different researchers have different definitions, and uh, some years ago, the, the, the person I consider the leading researcher in the field is Bruce Grayson, psychiatrist uh, from the University of Virginia, also recently retired, and he tried to get us all together to agree on a definition, and, and he couldn't wrangle these cats, so um, or herd these cats. So my definition is that in uh, although this this experience m happens most often when a person is either actually close to death, is in the threat of death, or is actually in the first few moments of death with like cardiac arrest, the experience actually occurs in any of a variety of extreme circumstances. So a person might have this experience when they're extremely grieved. They might have it when they're uh, in the extreme of physical exertion running a 50K race. They might have it in the extreme condition of rage or in the extreme equanimity of deep meditation. 
and there's research to indicate that the circumstance, no matter what the circumstances, the experience still has these certain qualities. So what the experience is, is uh, it can have an either or both of two aspects. And the first aspect is an out-of-body experience or what I call the material aspect because the person perceives himself to be out of their body watching or perceiving the material world. They see, they hear uh, what's going on. And, and uh, perception in this state is normal plus. So things look normal as they would from the body, but the, the person also has additional visual abilities like the ability to see in any direction that they're, they send their, their attention to, up, down, back, front, right, left. They have the ability to move through solid materials such as walls and thought happens at the at the speed of thought so person thinks something and boom it happens and so if if the person is in this material condition and usually the person their their sense of self is above the physical body although it can also be away from the physical body, but most often, at least at the beginning, people perceive themselves to be above their physical body. If they think, uh, you know, I wonder what my parents are doing in the waiting room, you know, waiting for me while I'm in surgery, boom, the person's right there seeing the parents. And, and so then the other aspect is what I call the transmaterial aspect, because the person has the perception usually of literally moving beyond the material world into a transmaterial domain. There might be a transition such as moving through a tunnel, an enclosure, or just moving rapidly through space, but they end up in this location that is not of the material world where they encounter non-material entities like deceased loved ones, uh, spirit guides, angels, uh, sometimes recognizable religious figures, other times a sense of being uh, very having a very familiar relationship with this spiritual being, but not being able to like identify them specifically. So that's it. It's this experience that can include a material aspect, a transmaterial aspect, or both. Usually, the material happens first, then the transmaterial, but sometimes. Somebody will have only one or the other. Sometimes they'll occur even in reverse order. Sometimes they even overlap, like someone seeing spiritual entities in the operating room, you know, while their body is in cardiac arrest. And so you've got both the material of the operating room and the transmaterial of these spiritual entities that are not of the material world. So and in the operating room, they wouldn't just see the room as if they were in their body. They'd see it and they'd see as if they were looking at themselves above themselves and hearing what the doctors were saying and seeing spiritual beings. Right. That's right. I think for, uh, for you, Dr. Holden, if I'm right, your, your main kind of area of interest is that, that material part of it, the veridical perception as it's known. That's kind of one of your main... Well, yeah, actually... Um, so veridical perception, which is, uh, you're so right, Darren, this is really probably my primary interest related to near-death experiences for reasons we can get into, but veridical perception is where a person receives information during the near-death experience that based on the condition and position of their physical body, they shouldn't be able to know, and yet is later verified as accurate. And particularly in cases where the information is completely unexpected or, or even contradicts what the person would assume. And it's uh, what they, the information they gained is verified by a credible third party. Like usually it's a physician who was there when, the, when a person went into cardiac arrest, that it's, that's all con, uh, found to be accurate. And most of the cases involve the material world, but actually some cases involve the transmaterial 
domain as well. As an example, someone might have a near-death experience, come back and regain consciousness and report to their family that's around them that they they met such and such a relative who was deceased. But as far as everybody there knows, that person is alive and well. Somebody just talked to them yesterday. And then a couple hours later, they get a phone call letting them know that this person had died suddenly of a heart attack uh, several hours before. So at the time of the near-death experience, that person really was dead. The near-death experiencer was the first to learn through their NDE. So, so there are things that can happen in the transmaterial domain that are also veridical. That's so fascinating. And that's the so-called peak in Darien experience, isn't it? Yeah, what has, has been called peak in Darien, which is a whole a term that really kind of doesn't make sense. And, but it, it's, uh, it's been renamed something like perception of people not known to have died, a perception of dead people not known to have died kind of a mouthful. I like that one better than Peak and Darien. That it's clearer. And just to clarify, these are people who died where it was completely unexpected. It wasn't, you know, someone's great grandmother who was elderly. It wasn't someone who'd been struggling with a disease. It would be like a 30-year-old who died in a, a healthy 30-year-old who died in a car accident. That's right. Yeah. It will uh, like an example would be a little boy who was hospitalized and in his NDE, he saw his older sister, who everybody knew was away at college and healthy. And uh, the parents, because they were at the hospital, they were out of reach of the college. And when they got home a few hours later, they found all these messages on their answering machine. The college had been trying to reach them because their daughter had died in a car accident a few hours before the son's near-death experience. So again, he was, he was right. She was, she had passed and nobody knew it at, at the time that he perceived it. Nobody in the, in the vicinity. I actually want to ask you, cause it's such an interesting field of study. What got you into studying NDEs? Well, you know, I, there is, I, there isn't just one thing. If I go all the way back, I've just always been interested in phenomena that are difficult to explain. And I read about psychic phenomena even as a preteen. In high school, I read about Edgar Cayce, the sleeping prophet who could diagnose illnesses of people that he never met that lived, you know, hundreds of miles away who had these rare, like, uh, difficult to diagnose things. And he would go into a trance and and diagnose them, and then they would end up getting life-saving treatment and stuff like that. I read about mysticism, or at least I tried to in high school. And then when I was, I believe it was between my freshman and sophomore year of college, my father read a book called The Great Soul Trial. And it's a nonfiction book about a reclusive miner from Arizona. This is back around like 1960. And he went off to mine uh, in the mountains as he did routinely, but he never came back. And long story short, the state of Arizona opened his safe deposit box when they presumed him dead and found several hundred thousand dollars and a note that he wanted the money, handwritten note, he wanted the money used for research on the survival of consciousness after death. So the state of Arizona put a little notice in the paper and thought nobody would pay attention, but to their surprise, over a hundred individuals and organizations came forward to try to claim the money. So the state actually had to hold a trial where a judge heard each of these people testify how they would use the money to fulfill the wishes of this guy. His name was James Kidd. And the book, The Great Soul Trial, is mostly the transcripts from the from the trial. And so I read about the research director of the American Society for Psychical Research, the research director from the American, uh, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on the, the American Psychical Association, talking about how they would uh, do this research. So it was an introduction into the scientific investigation 
of these phenomena that are not easy to investigate, not, not easy to research. So that was probably around 1970. And then in 1978, I read Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life, which is the first book that it's really considered now to have opened the contemporary field of near-death studies. And it's in that book that Moody coined the term near-death experience and described uh, many cases of this. And, and then fast forward another seven years, and I'm working on my doctoral dissertation in counseling at a program that had courses, uh, like one course was titled Transpersonal Perspective in Education and Counseling. And we studied things like near-death experiences, psychic phenomena, Stanislav Grof's discoveries from LSD research about the realms of the human unconscious moving into domains beyond the material and, and so forth. And I was trying to find a, a topic for my dissertation. And I tried like five different things, all of which aborted at some point. And finally, I decided to try something related to near-death experiences. And that's the one that went through and enabled me to finish my degree. And by the time I I finished that study, I was just absolutely hooked on research on NDEs and and the related, there are a lot of related phenomena that occur during NDEs that I've also gotten into research on, such as after death communication. So um, so that's that's how I got into it. I love that. It's rare you hear people who got into it so young. I mean, you've had a whole lifetime of this. That's really I love that. Yeah. This, this phenomenon of veridical perception is documented now in a book called The Self Does Not Die, and it contains over 100 cases of verified paranormal phenomena associated with NDEs. And in, as I said, in most cases, verified by physicians or surgeons who were working with a person during a medical crisis. So they're very credible. and. And even I, who had uh, actually provided the first, the data set uh, for the, that was the foundation for this book, when I actually finished editing, I, I served as editor of the book and, and just read it through. It was amazing to me to read one case after another from these physicians from all over the world who not only have no reason to falsify, you know, what they experienced, but actually have incentive not to report what they've experienced, because in by and large, the medical community is still very philosophically materialist, you know, thinking everything come, as uh, Darren so aptly says, the, the mind is what the brain does. And so these cases where people are having perceptions of things that, that cannot be explained in terms of our current materialist understanding of the working of the the senses, the brain, uh, rationality, and all that. It exceeds all that. It's um, it's just it's very impactful to to read these cases one after another. And it's certainly a very important book because when you think of near death experiences, generally you think of the well media publicized ones like the Eben Alexanders, the Anita Morjani's and people like that but you don't realize how many of these take place in a veridical form that aren't really yeah. blown up on the media and I, I suppose if i could just raise an important point again your opinion on it what what would you say to those who are m more materialistic minded or maybe aren't familiar with the research when they would say that well it might be interesting stories but that's all they are they're anecdotes in in a book form which isn't really much use yeah, well, um, that's that's the value of having cases. We we refer the, to them as cases rather than anecdotes because they've all been investigated and shown to be verified. And so, when uh, as Bruce Grayson points out, all research begins with cases. So when cases come together to show some kind of pattern, then you have you know, a very, it, it gets your attention. And since then, 
there's been extensive research on NDEs and their after effects involving thousands of people from all over the world. So the experience and its after effects are irrefutable. The veridical aspects are less common than, you know, NDEs in general, but the fact that they are, uh, that they're, you know, are over a hundred cases and that book is about to be revised and they're adding 10 or 15 more cases that have come to light since the book was published, I think in 2014 or something like that. This is what science is. It's the collection of cases, investigating them, trying to show if there's any way to explain them other than that somehow consciousness was exceeding the function of the brain. I actually have two questions then. First, mm -hmm. you said the after effects are very consistent among people. Can you explain some of the after effects? Sure. Well, I like to, ca they're, they're extensive. And so I like to categorize them as PSPS, -PS, just like at the, after a letter, you would write a PS. Um, this is after an NDE. These are the after effects. And uh, first is psychological. And the most uh, extensive finding is that virtually everyone who's had a near-death experience, and by the way, out of all the people who, for example, survive a close brush with death, uh, research indicates that 80 to 90 percent of people won't remember anything unusual, but 10 to 20 percent will remember a near-death experience. So for most people, they get hit by a car, they lose consciousness, and then they wake up, you know, hours or days later in the hospital, don't remember anything unusual. But for 10 to 20 percent, they'll wake up or regain con uh, normal consciousness and report that during the time that their body was unconscious, they had this experience of being, you know, uh, in the material or transmaterial domains, but, uh, but functioning apart from their physical body. So it's important to realize that this, you know, how like often or not often this happens, but for those who have had a near death experience, the most widely verified after effect is that people lose their fear of death. They have absolutely no fear because they've experienced it as, as they believe, and they know that there's nothing to fear, that as one person said, it's like walking from this room into the next room. It's just like that. And uh, now they might still fear, you know, a long suffering path toward death. Nobody wants that. But death itself holds no fear for them. And then they also become uh, just, we're talking here about psychological changes. Their values change. They become less materialistic, more concerned about other people, concerned about the planet, animals. Uh, some NDEers just can't stand to even kill a fly anymore because they have this profound empathy with other, and they, they just know that consciousness is precious. And so those are some of the psychological changes. And then there are spiritual changes. People become more interested in spirituality. It might take the form of religion, but usually not. Usually people become uh, more spiritual and, and less religious. And that doesn't mean that NDEers aren't sometimes still religious or involved in their religion, they are, but there's a tendency to move away from religion because religion wasn't big enough to explain what they experienced. Also, some after effects that might be considered spiritual is people develop psychic abilities. Um, they see the future. They have profound empathy for other people such that they know what's going on in another person's life just by being near them or thinking about them. And uh, sometimes people develop healing abilities, like a lot of NDEers experience that they have energy in their hands and that they're, they can use their hands to, for, to help physical healing. Um, so those kinds of uh, spiritual things. And, and 
and a lot of NDEers feel like they've now have like one foot in the material world and one foot in the transmaterial or spiritual domain that they're it's part of their consciousness is still there and so it's kind of like the person who's walking along and their feet are on the ground that's the material domain but their head is in the clouds that's the spiritual domain and then there are physical after effects and these include people have changes in their metabolism um, they become a lot of times more sensitive to medication, to allergens in the environment and things like that. Sometimes they report needing less sleep and, and even needing less food. Uh, sometimes they'll have changes in their diet where they may want to not eat meat anymore, partly for that because of that consciousness thing about animals. But on the other hand, I have an ND ear friend who has to have meat every day or she doesn't feel right. So none of these things are like true for every single person. They're, they're trends or tendencies or likelihoods uh, for people. And one of the interesting after effects, uh, physical after effects, is electromagnetic. And this has been studied scientifically by more than one research group that ND ears report and they're their, their intimates, the people around them, spouses, children, parents, and that sort of thing, report as well that in the vicinity of the near-death experiencer, electrical things go wonky. They, they, um, they misact, they break down. Last week, I met a gal who happens to be local who realized that a memory she had two memories she had actually from her life, one from when she nearly drowned as a two-year-old and one from when she had heart surgery as an adult were actually near-death experiences. And it came as something of a shock to her, like she had always just not known what to do with these memories or put them away. And then uh, something happened and and she started reading about NDEs and realized that this applied to her. So she she found me and contacted me and we met at Starbucks. And after we talked quite a bit about the things that she needed to to digest, you know, her newfound sense of herself, I asked her, are you wearing a watch? And she said, no, she said, I, she said, I don't know what it is. I just can't wear a watch. Every time I wear it, the battery dies. I replace the battery. It dies again within a week. I replace it again. She said, I just, I've given up. I, I laughed and I said, you know, this is a, this is an NDE thing. And she's like, what? And I said, yeah, this is, this is a known thing that I said, when I go to the IONS conference and I'm meeting somebody new, I'll glance down at their wrist to see if they're wearing a watch. And that's my first clue as to whether they're a near-death experiencer or somebody who's there out of interest but hasn't actually had an NDE. And she said, oh, gosh. She said, well, she said, I have all kinds of electrical problems at my house. And she said, we're about to move because th we think there's something fundamentally wrong with the electronics. And I said, don't move because it's you, babe. It's when you move, you're going to have trouble at, at that uh, location. And she has a lot of anxiety um, that's related to things unrelated to her NDE. And I, I said to her, you know, the fact that you have rather high anxiety probably exacerbates the problem because we know from research that when people become emotionally aroused, that's when things start going, you know, light bulbs start flickering or explode and um, computers crash and you lose your cell phone call and, uh, you know, all those kinds of things um, happen. So NDEers who are savvy about this learn that if they're having something like that, they need to like move away from their computer, get quiet, get into a place of equanimity and then come back and, and they'll be able to uh, function okay. So that's physical. So anyway, now I've talked about psychological, spiritual, physical, and the last S is social, because you can imagine that if somebody's having all these changes, they essentially come back from a near-death experience transformed. They are transformed in the experience. So they come back in many cases feeling like a 
somewhat different person. And this is going to have reverberations in their social lives. So if someone has had a near-death experience and the experiencer is married, there's a much higher than usual likelihood that they'll get divorced, not because of conflict or that sort of thing, but we know that it's because the value changes happen. And if the, you know, usually when two people marry, they have relatively similar values. Well, if one person has an NDE and their values diverge from their partner, those people are likely to divorce. And there are a few cases where the partner that didn't have the NDE started off with more NDE-like values. So when the other, when their spouse has an NDE and their values converge, those marriages continue happier than ever. And but you can imagine if this happens with parents and children, if a child has an experience and parents are not knowledgeable knowledgeable about it, they can be very confused and and uncertain and, and inadvertently respond in unhelpful ways. If parents have it, you know, like there was a guy who had an NDE and after his NDE, he couldn't watch TV anymore because there's so much violence and and negativity and he was just too sensitive and it, it was just too upsetting. Well, the his family used to every night get together and watch TV together. So suddenly he's not able to do this family bonding thing and it, it disrupts the whole family system. So there are these social repercussions in people's lives. But the good news is that after an average of about seven years, it takes a while, people tend to integrate the experience and, and they may have reformed their life in some way. They may have changed friend groups because their their friends are now like meditators as opposed to bar you know going out to the bars every night and they may have even reformulated their their family especially family of creation and and eventually they say that you know there are a lot of challenges to to having had a near death experience you know having to integrate and and deal with all these changes but they that they uh, by and large say that it's it was it's absolutely worth it despite the challenges i mean it sounds amazing i would like to have one without the ne- you know ideally i'd like to not get sick yeah. not be in an accident and somehow have one um so right that was thank you that was well they, they can happen spontaneously spontaneously as well through meditation practice and things like that can't they you don't necessarily have to be in a near-death state yeah, no, that's right. That's right. I do have a question about that. And then I also, I'll ask first. So is there one case that you've looked into that stands out above all else? I mean, I'm sure a lot are amazing, but is there one that's just amazing? Yeah, actually, I don't know whether Anita talked about this aspect of her experience. The Anita we're talking about is Anita Merjani. She is very well known for having had an incredible near-death experience, and she wrote a book about it called Dying to Be Me, if you want to read it and learn more. You can also Google her. She has done some amazing talks about it. Because it's a kind of a subtle aspect, but to me, it's the most most mind-bending, and that is that when she was with a spiritual entity, and I don't remember who it was, as right before she returned to her body, and the spiritual entity conveyed to her that it was time for her to decide whether she was going to stay here or go back into that physical body. And she looked down at that body, and she's like, that, you know, that body is a mess. And like, I really can go back there. And the spiritual entity is saying yes. And she's saying, well, I said, I don't know, because a nurse was just here taking my blood. And isn't the result of that blood test going to determine whether my physical body lives or dies? And the spiritual entity conveyed to her, no, your decision about whether you're going to live or die physically 
is going to determine the outcome of the blood test. Wow. How, isn't that mind bending? That, that, that our consciousness, our consciousness is under certain circumstances or when we have access to its power, it has the ability to influence the material world. Which I guess split particle experiment shows and spoon bending shows some, but this that's another level. Mm -hmm, another level. Because if she was stage four terminal cancer at the last stages. Right. So mm -hmm. I guess this leaves, which I mean, it's a little philosophical. I know you probably won't have a factual answer. And obviously people are going to have some sensitive emotions about that. Does that mean our... Does everybody have a choice? Did our loved ones choose to leave us? I assume someone who was 100 years old who passed probably doesn't have the choice to come back and live. Well, of course, from a, sci from a scientific perspective, this is kind of hard to answer because anybody who chose not to come back has not come back to be in one of our research studies, you know? So, um, but... But I would say based on what I know from, uh, what we know from near-death experiences is that about half of people have a choice and obviously chose to return. And the other half either were tooling along in their NDE and suddenly, boom, they were just back in their body. There was no, there was no choice in, in the sense that, you know, nobody said, do you want to go back or not? But another subgroup from that group is given a choice. So we, it, you know, it's, it's hard to know what to say about people who don't come back, you know, and, and that it does seem like there are some circumstances where the body is so far gone that it would be really impossible for the person to return to life, you know, like, I remember when I was a high school counselor and I had a, a student who was in a car accident with his mother where he saw her beheaded in the car accident. There's, I, you know, there's no choice in that matter for her to come back to her physical body. And the other thing is that even people who have a choice, they sometimes well, and there are people who don't want to come back and they're told to return. They're, they're forced to return, so to speak. But for the people who have a sense that they could go or they could stay, it's entirely up to them. They have a sense that either way, everything would be, will be fine. Everything will be perfectly fine. So, so even when people don't return, there is a sense that according to near-death experiencers, a sense that everything is fine, as devastating as losses are to us in the physical domain. And we, and we have to figure out how to move on in our lives without our loved ones. In the big picture, this big spiritual picture, all is well, and everything is unfolding as, as it's meant to. So it, that I'm giving sort of partly what we can extrapolate from science and partly sort of what I've gathered, like my own opinion. That I think that really makes sense. Yeah, I can't see a hundred year old or obviously someone whose body has been so tragically harmed in an accident. You can't yeah. live that way. So you also mentioned and talked about how some people have types of NDEs through meditation, no illness, no danger to their body. Have you noticed a difference in strength or power of NDE in a meditation versus an accident or illness? Well, and actually I can speak not from what I've noticed, but from what research actually shows. And that is that there is no difference in the nature or strength of the experience or in the after effects, um, that these experiences seem to be psycho-spiritually equivalent. It's just that I think what, what again, now I'm getting into the realm of my, my opinion, I think the reason these things happen under extreme circumstances is that when we're in these extremes, it's like our consciousness gets sort of loosened from its connection to our physical body. 
and and we open ourselves to our consciousness functioning apart from our physical body. So if there, it it, re, it really doesn't matter what the mechanism is or the 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 circumstances in which the experience happens, it does tend to be the same in nature and in after effects. And it's just, I think the reason that we have so many more reports of people who survived a close brush with death is that that's the most reliable way to loosen that connection between our consciousness and our body. So I suppose to come to, come to a, a more kind of practical side of, of this, there will, of course, be those who say, you know, come on, we know that human beings are frightened of death. All this kind of thing is going to be either our body's way of protecting ourselves, our emotional way of, of you know, dealing with the finality of death. Um, you know, how can we trust the perceptions of a brain that's dying as opposed to one where we know that a living brain is already very suggestible? Um, what I suppose, what kind of physical material explanations have been put forward and what are the counters to them? Well, I would say to the theory that people have these experiences because they're afraid of death and they're creating some kind of mental thing to soothe themselves. One question is, why doesn't everybody have one then? Because fear of death is pervasive among humans. And yet 80 to 90% of people who survive close brushes with death don't have a near-death experience. But the, the bigger question is trying to explain why these experiences occur for in any way, whether it's a physical explanation, like there's you know lack of oxygen to the brain, which by the way, research has shown not to be the case. In fact, research has shown a lot of these not to be the case. You know, there's high carbon dioxide level or there's release of some dimethyltryptamine and yeah. Yes, right, at death or, you know, or whether it's a psychological explanation like it's, it comes out of fear of death and all that. All of these theories are brought into question with the phenomenon of veridical perception. You know, if people are perceiving things that are impossible to have perceived from their the vantage point of where their physical body was, impossible to have rationally in, you know, predicted, and yet are accurate. It just indicates that at least those experiences were more than subjectively real. They were, they had elements of objective reality, and it suggests then that those that those experiences that don't have veridical aspects maybe they they don't differ from the other experiences. So they they seem to be just as real as the veridical ones what kind of opposition do you do you get when you bring up those kind of cases that do bring objective um, information probably the one that i think is the most difficult to counter is the claim that the that the experiencer somehow got the information before during or after the 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 near death event and so so for for example one of my favorite ones is a woman who's in surgery she unexpectedly flatlines and then she is they manage to resuscitate her after a few minutes of course she never regains consciousness during this she's completely anesthetized her eyes are taped shut you know all the things that happen during a full anesthesia and surgery and so they finish the surgery. She goes into post-op. She regains consciousness. Her surgeon comes to visit her and see how she's doing. She says, I know that I died during the surgery. And he's sort of taken aback. And he, how do you know that? And she said, well, I was up above the ceiling watching as you did this. And then this person did that. And then somebody came in who hadn't been in the surgery and did this stuff and then left before the surgery was finished. And everything that the patient described, the surgeon said was exactly accurate to what he remembered having happened. And she said, and besides that, 
She said, like I said, I was above the ceiling and I could see through the ceiling and I could also see through the adjacent walls. And I saw that in the next operating room, they were amputating a man's leg. And when they finished the amputation, they put the leg in a yellow, a bright yellow plastic bag to dispose of it. And the surgeon is again, well, he, this time he's just kind of perplexed because he says, I, you know, I don't know what's going on in the other operating rooms. But at this point, it's a few hours later, you know, this a few hours have transpired. So he goes back to the hospital records and he finds that, in fact, in the operating room next to him, while he was doing the surgery on this woman, they were amputating a man's leg. Now, he had never been in that operating room because it was specialized for amputations, and that's not what he did. But at this time that he was looking it up in the records, the room was empty. So he just backed, went to the room and backed in and peeked inside, and there he saw the yellow plastic bags they used to dispose of amputated body parts. Now... If you think that nurses are somehow walking around and saying in within earshot of, of patients, oh, we amputated a man's leg today and put it in a yellow plastic bag to dispose of it. I mean, just how likely is that? And so, so the claim that, that people got this information somehow, there's another one where a man during... I believe it was during cardiac arrest, but I don't remember the exact, but it, it was, he was in the hospital and very ill and he left his body. He rose up and he saw, um, he, he actually rose up through the floors of the hospital and right above in the next floor, he saw these, what he called like models and machinery and things that, and he couldn't make sense of it. But when, after his NDE and he regained consciousness and he was telling a nurse about this, she was just amazed because right above them was their training facility where they had mannequins and machinery and things for for training nurses, which is what he saw. Now, again, do you think that nurses are walking around saying, you know, so I was upstairs in the floor right above us and and working on this mannequin, you know, trying to do CPR on it or something, you know, it, it, the probability that people learn this information some other way, and they never remember that it ever came from like overhearing a conversation or something. That's really weird. You would think at least one or two people would say, well, I don't know, I overheard these people, but these are all people who don't remember ever hearing it. They remember perceiving it directly during their near-death experience. So, so that's, I would say, the, the biggest challenge to veridical perception is people who claim that the person must have somehow learned this information through normal means when if you just, if you read the actual cases, that explanation is really hard to hold water. And I guess I have a question and I don't know how answerable this will be, but if this is a fact and what happens as we go to the next dimension, state of consciousness, why do only 10% of people have NDEs? Because if it's real, wouldn't everybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a great question. And we, you know, as you said, it's not really answerable from uh, scientific research because, you know, we, we can't know why some people, what, what we do know from research is that we have found no difference between the 80 to 90% of people who don't remember anything after a close brush with death and the 10 to 20% of people who do remember a near-death experience. No difference between them. To make it further complicated, among all the people who have a near-death experience, about 90% of the experiences are dominated by pleasurable feelings, peace, joy, love, and uh, ecstasy and so forth. And about 10% are distressing. They're dominated by distressing feelings like confusion, terror, horror, something like that. And uh, we have found no difference between those. So this is where my answer is not a scientific answer. It's a heaven only knows answer. Heaven only knows why uh, some people and not others. There have been some some theories and one of the probably the one that I think carries the most weight but again doesn't 
and it doesn't seem to fit every single um, situation that we can, as far as we can tell, is the possibility that some people need the experience for their spiritual development and others may not, or others may be so entrenched in material existence that even an experience like this would actually be more disruptive than helpful to them in spiritual advancement. So so that's a possibility, but it's purely speculation. And I suppose another factor that has to be taken into consideration in, a, in, in essence of the circumstance that the entity takes part in, if they're under heavy sedation, for instance, a lot of sedative drugs include um, amnesic properties. So how can we tell the difference between someone who did have an experience but don't remember it and someone that just didn't have an experience because experientially they'd be exactly the same and you know you don't know how the filtration of the brain is working whether that memory is blocked on psychological grounds or whether there are intrusive drugs that are taking am amnesic effects you know it's, it, it is very much up in the air yeah that's right and that's a really good point darren because there is research indicating that people who survived cardiac arrest there's a tendency for people to remember NDEs more if there were fewer drugs involved. So the drugs do seem to interfere. And as you said, it is standard practice now, whenever somebody gets full anesthesia, that they get an amnesic drug so that they won't remember anything. Because there is this very rare phenomenon of surgical memory anesthesia awareness anesthesia awareness thank you very much and and just in case that's going to happen they they just don't want it to happen it it's the result of not actually having enough anesthetic and the person temporarily comes out of you know from anesthesia and they may be in severe pain that's why they they give it routinely now so that they just want to make sure that people don't remember any pain that all makes sense. And then we don't know. I mean, apparently research seems to show our brains don't store a lot of other dimensional memories of, you know, past lives or, you know, Dr. Tucker's research. I always wonder, and again, getting a little speculative, do you think as time goes on, this is going to be something more and more of us experience as medicine improves and we're able to bring people back from further away? Is this going to become more of a normal part of our society? I, I don't know, because uh, what we were just talking about, you know, using amnesic drugs during surgery and things like that, that mitigates against people remembering. I do wonder whether, you know, there's a new research or relatively new about the use of psychedelics and how they facilitate similar experiences, similar after effects, and that people may, it may become more common in our culture for people to seek those, those experiences and have awakenings from that particular circumstance. But I don't know. And again, getting a touch philosophical, maybe more than scientific. One thing I wonder, so if this is all embedded in who we are, in our experience, you know, we're going back and seeing our loved ones. Why do you think we don't remember that in so many ways here? Not only logically, we innately don't remember it and that death is our biggest fear. Why do you think that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, we, I, I do want to be clear that this is definitely speculation, and, and I've certainly thought a lot about this question, like, why are we put in this physical realm and, uh, and our memory of who we really are is erased and that sort of thing? And, and I, one thing that I've thought is that it's kind of like going to school. You know, when, when I'm in school, when I was in third grade, I needed to be there and focused on that, not thinking about, you know, my past lives and, and that sort of thing. It's, it's like a way of putting blinders on that, that help us to be focused on this lifetime. And what near-death experiencers say is that we are here for a purpose, and the purpose is to advance in our capacity to love. And so, 
in order to fulfill that purpose, we need to have those blinders so that we're focused on this lifetime, our decisions from moment to moment in this lifetime, and not be um, distracted, you know, by extraneous information. And to kind of say the other side of it is that a lot of near-death experiencers feel chronic longing. They long to return to the joy and bliss that they felt in their near-death experience. And it makes physical existence somewhat torturous for them. They wouldn't end their life in most, the vast majority of cases, they would never dream of ending their life to get there sooner because they know their life has purpose. They're here for a reason. But it's not easy to live this life with all of its pain and suffering and know that something awaits that is free of all that. And so in a way, it's a blessing that we forget so that we can live. And, and I think that our fear of death is just to help us stay physically alive. And in a, a roundabout way, that's meeting a spiritual purpose. So that's as far as I've been able to think on, on that subject. I, I can kind of I can kind of personally attest to that sense of depression as well I suppose because a lot of my suicidal when I was suicidal with depression a lot of those feelings stem from that feeling of being incredibly restricted no or, you know imagining that there could be something so much more with infinite possibility infinite creative potential and yet I'm stuck here yeah. you know in this physical body that that kind of feeling contributed quite considerably to my suicidal tendency so I can imagine once you've had a glimpse of that I mean I've never had near death experience but I can imagine how much one how yeah. much more wonderful that would be so to have actually been there I can imagine what a torment that must be on your mind yeah exactly and and it has to be balanced or like outweighed by a sense that despite all that we're here for a reason and uh to and another thing Andy Ears say is that we're here to enjoy life. You know, like I I'm I can let go of material things, but I enjoy getting dressed in the morning and putting on an outfit that is color coordinated and you know that sort of thing. We're meant to enjoy what we have and and also to be of service to our fellow humans and other other creatures and and the and the earth and so so living learning and serving are an opportunity that we have in physical existence that we don't have in spiritual existence in the same way so being able to appreciate that yeah i think that's that's kind of a beautiful way to end it's officially an hour and i know that's all we've asked of your time unless darren do you have a final question or dr holden is there no no i think i'm good i just think that's such a beautiful ending too and you know perfectly landed on the hour exactly unless dr holden is there anything else you want to add or no i think i i agree with you i think the the, the whole purpose of studying near-death experiences, their after effects and all that is um, for, for us here to answer the question of what then shall we do in this life based on what we know? And it does boil down to the things you know we just mentioned, loving, learning, serving. Um, that's, that's what we're here for. And, and th so that's kind of the, the ultimate purpose of of all of our research endeavors. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And where can our listeners find you? Well, I do have a website, janholden.com, and I'm president of the International Association for Near Death Studies, so people can reach me through there as well. Yeah, I think I think one of those two places would work. To get more information on what the fuck just happened, to get updates on when the book launches, download Grief Bingo, and more, go to wtfjusthappened.net, check us out, 
and subscribe to our newsletter. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. It makes such a difference, especially for a new podcast like this one. And if you've had any crazy what the fucks yourself, have any questions, feedback, or just want to say hi, reach out either on Instagram at WTF underscore just underscore happen underscore or email me at hello at WTF just happened.net. And remember, you don't have to draw any final conclusions as you wonder what the fuck just happened.